Hello, and welcome to Religion and Life. I'm your host, Ozzy Ostwald. When we think about religion, scientific laboratories don't often come to mind, but we're at a point in our understanding of religion where the foundations of religiosity can not only be theorized about, but also empirically tested. My guest today, Dr. Lee McCorkle, spends much of his time helping us better understand the evolutionary and psychological underpinnings of spirituality and religious faith. Welcome, Dr. McCorkle, and thank you for taking time out to spend with us today. Thank now, you. I, I can call you Lee, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah thank I, you. I, I know I can. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've known you for a long time. You were um, a student of our department back in the 90s That's and right. uh, went on to bigger and better things, and uh, you're, you're now uh, working in some fascinating fields of religious studies, groundbreaking fields, I might add. Um, so, in general, uh, we would describe what you're doing as the cognitive science of religion. Could you maybe explain to us what that entails and, sure. and what it's all about? There was a sort of a paradigm shift about 30 to 40 years ago, and people started, uh, because of cognitive science and cognitive linguistics and cognitive anthropology, started to become more interested in culture through the lens of the human mind. And so uh, we've learned so many things, you know, in the last uh, few decades about how the mind or the brain works, but, you know, it's still a mystery right. why we do all these cultural things around the world. Um, and so um, I was lucky enough to find myself under a pioneer in that field as a student uh, in graduate school, um, Tom Lawson and Harvey Whitehouse, and uh, two pioneers. And uh, so now the focus is, is utilizing multiple disciplines mm -hmm. to study religion as opposed to maybe just being in the history of religions or philosophy of religion or uh, anthropology. We're, we've now got multiple, multiple disciplines. So, so when I was trained eons ago, yeah. we would have looked at material culture sure. and the, the relationship between material culture and ritual. Sure. But now you're actually looking at the relationship between ritual and, and brain structure or ritual and brain function. Maybe. Right. And, and, and the thing is, it's important to, uh, to point out that it's because of all that cultural study that we can ask the questions that we're able to ask. Hmm. You know, hmm. the, the hmm. hows and the whys. Well, you know, you can't just say uh, willy-nilly, go in and say, oh, the ritual looks like it looks like this. Now, these are people that have spent their lives studying these cultures, and right. they notice these things because that they're experts in it. And we're able to go to people that do uh, experimental testing and, and things uh, that work with the brain, disciplines that work with the brain or mind, right? The two different right. things here. Right. But, um, and we're able now to go to them and go, hey, we think we can pinpoint certain ideas we have in the field and we would like you to help us test them hmm. to see if they're maybe uh, the evidence is there that this is the case. Now, maybe this is a presupposition within the field. I don't know. So mm -hmm. I may not be asking this question properly, but mm -hmm. is it uh, presupposed with the work you're doing that religion mm -hmm. originates in the mind in some way? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's that the religion is actually coming out of brain function okay. right there's two there's two schools of thought okay uh, the first is is that uh, it's ba based in an evolutionary system that the brain has evolved to be a religious brain right and all the behaviors and the beliefs and things like that you see are a product of that mm -hmm. or there is the side of the uh, the byproduct theory which is we evolved uh, to be social animals and the byproducts of that socialization and the things that we've had to deal with in environment for the last 100,000 years uh, have resulted in what we see in scaffolding that is religion, that is sometimes good for our cultural, sca you know, cultural mm -hmm. uh, cohesion, and sometimes it looks, um, at least to the observer, it looks uh, fundamentally problematic or right. pathological. A la Freud. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. I mean, but yeah, Freud was on to something. He just didn't have the tools really to uh, assess. What, I mean, he's, he, I would call him the, uh, the father of evolutionary psychology, but he really didn't have the tools 
um, and he didn't have the methodology to, to, to sort out many of the ideas that he had. But right. I think they were coming around on Freud again, not that he was completely correct, um, and we don't use the same terms that he used, but that mm-hmm. he was on to something, that he was trying to do a science of the brain that was based on evolution. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I want to I want to return to um, this kind of evolutionary development of religion, mm-hmm. but I just want to mm-hmm. clarify one thing. So, um, the person of faith, the the mm-hmm. I guess the subjects that you would be working with, mm-hmm. has a notion that religion somehow originates outside themselves for the most part, sure. yeah. uh, either through revelation or. Th- uh, through some sort of encounter with spirituality, sure. But I guess from from uh, studying religion academically, that's not something that you can entertain as a possibility, mm-hmm. really. Or even the historian of religion well, can't entertain that supernatural origin of religion. Well, I don't necessarily think that, like, as a um, a researcher on on uh, these cultures, when I go in, I fully believe the participants um, believe in what they're doing. I mm-hmm. mean, and and I don't think that actually distracts. The science, I don't actually think distracts from the religious meaning that it's made out for the participant. Right. We're just trying to uh, understand more how, how it works. Gotcha. As opposed to maybe not why is not the question that we, we are interested in, but more how this happens. So if, let's say someone hmm. does um, a very, uh, uh, what we would call, uh, a ritual that's high in sensory pageantry, all the bells and whistles, mm-hmm. extreme, you know, in, in, in average everyday life. We want to know how the mind um, processes a certain way so that people feel the, the result in the end to them. Right. If that okay. makes any sense. If that sure. makes any sense, yeah. Absolutely makes sense. Yeah. So is. Uh, does your research show or suggest that there is some sort of evolutionary advantage to yeah. religion, uh, to the mind, I yeah. guess? Because if, if we were to follow evolutionary theory, right. uh, we would have to assume that there's some sort of advantage to becoming or evolving into religious beings. Right. Well, okay, so there are different schools of thought within okay. the field. Yeah. Um, my own personal uh, opinion on this, um, based on my own research, is that... Um, there is an evolutionary advantage because religion has acted like a scaffold on a building. Imagine a building is getting made and there's this huge scaffold on it, right? That helps you build part to part to part to part. Mm -hmm. And then the scaffolding either is partially taken away or it's embedded into the building itself. And now you can't go back and take the scaffolding off. So religion has functioned over our human history as and religion I use as a, a heuristic here, mm-hmm. this min- aggregate of things, right? Is it's acted as a scaffold to help us as social groups function and evolve and, and to survive, you know, mm. in, in many ways. And and I think that anyone that's done any kind of field work um, uh, 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 out out in the world on religions, or just observed in in some way, can see that it has very powerful motivations to protect the group that it's about hmm. and to defend that group against outside harm, whether that be other people, whether that be environmental factors, right? you know, what, what have you. So it sounds like maybe, um, if I'm hearing you correctly, religion has at least a couple of functions. Mm-hmm. Um, on an individual level, it functions psychologically, mm-hmm. uh, perhaps to uh, protect, protect against angst of certain mm-hmm. types, uh, but also has this social, uh, provides social legitimations for, and provides for group constructions and group mm-hmm. identities and mm-hmm. so forth. That result in institutions. Right. And material artifacts like texts and archi- you know, archeological structures that we see throughout history, right? Mm-hmm. Um, wh- what changes, or wh- what has been difficult, I think, in religious studies, um, in the history of religions, is that we are presented all this evidence from the historical period and from the prehistorical period, and we have anthropologists that look at modern cultures. And so we're trying, you know, we've, for, for 100 years, historians of religions and anthropologists have tried to resolve wh- why do people do this? And mm-hmm. I think fundamentally that's what we're interested in. Religion is, uh, has been around um, in one way, in one form or another, 
for as long as we have human history and prehistory. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, we, we, we pretty much assume that now in the fields, in both anthropology and history of religions. Right, right. And why are there so many different kinds? Hmm. And you know, the, the explanation for many years was that it's because culture contextualizes these things, but it's not fundamental to being human, hmm. right? Which is kind of a weird thing to say, because if it exists throughout time and it, and it exists pretty much everywhere in one form or another, then it seems like it is <laughs> fundamental to humans, right. Right? right? Or at least social animals. Now, now there's a lot of work in, on birds and other complex social mammals that we see the things that we thought were human are now being stripped away, hmm. like language, the making of tools. We even see ritualized behaviors in some other primates and birds and things like that that make our rituals <laughs> you know, not so special anymore, even hmm. though they're scripted right. you know, or whatever. So I think when we talk about the, the mind and the brain, we are looking at the specific types of mental architecture that have evolved for a certain reason to keep us on this planet and keep you know, transmitting our genes, right? right. But also that these uh, uh, certain, uh, I like to do the uh, Swiss Army knife as an example. Hmm. We've developed a Swiss Army knife. It's uh, Stephen Mythen uh, developed this analogy. Um, and the Swiss Army knife was used to do specific things for the mind. And many times it's being asked to do things that it wasn't designed for hmm. that specific tool. Now it's being asked to go with several of the tools right. together. And maybe this is what religion uh, has become as a scaffold. It's you're in the environment now and you know you have a particular problem, an environmental danger, and religion is the working of multiple tools in the mind to solve these problems. Hmm. Right, right. Um, Malinowski is the best example of this. Right, uh, you know his famous work where he had the lagoon um, fishermen and he had the deep sea fishermen. Well, the deep sea fishermen engage in many, in many um, uh, rituals that are much more complex and much more uh, symbolically, uh, I guess, uh, powerful. Right. Because uh, Malinowski believed it was because their uh, job was so much more dangerous, right? So they used this sort of supernatural uh, control over the environment to, you know, sort of hedge their bets. Right. That I want to return safe back from this particular job today, so I better do all the bells and whistles. I think uh, Peter Berger talked about that as yeah. well, and said that um, the, the more, the more, essentially, the the, the more um, dangerous situation uh, mm -hmm. a group would find themselves in, or the um, the, the more legitimations they need. So mm -hmm. they would have these elaborate rituals mm -hmm. that would reinforce their place in mm -hmm. the world, in the universe. Um, so, do, so sounds like now that not only are working, we're working with a model where the mind itself mm -hmm. is functioning religiously mm -hmm. to produce certain things like rituals, but the rituals then act back on the social sure. group and on the individual to create group solidarity or to answer certain mm -hmm. existential questions. And I mean, for the, uh, you know, if you look at the work of Dan Sperber, it allows them to have something to make meaning out of. And human, humans are about meaning. I mean, we are right. meaning-making creatures. Religion, in a lot of ways, is about us being able to figure out how to make meaning out of the world because of biological determinism is a, a very sad thought. Hmm. If, uh, you know, you'd have to be a philosopher to really get into the, the details of it. But, right. by, you know, if we just sit there, hey, we just popped out and we live and we die, and hopefully we don't uh, get tormented during our lives here, um, you know, this sort of Nietzsche right. view of the world, right? is that um, we hope that we are here for more than something than just this animal that's born and dies. Right. So religion in a lot of ways for people, um, by engaging in a ritual, it allows them to form meanings that are important to them. And when they can share in a meaning, you know, you, and that's something that's interesting too, do you actually share in a real meaning right. uh, with someone? What, what does that mean, right? Mm -hmm. Um, uh, is that uh, this is about humans trying to 
make their behavior somehow rationalized gotcha. to themselves by their already um, uh, ongoing narratives. Yeah. Well, so far we've talked a lot of, about theory of how religion works and what it does and how it functions. Right. I, I'm kind of interested in how you actually measure these things. So you're in a laboratory. Are you, right. are you measuring brain waves? Are you measuring hormones? Yeah. Are you measuring um, some other sort of cognitive mm -hmm. response? Um, how do you go about uh, going to the laboratory and trying to empirically test mm -hmm. some of the things we think we know about okay. the, the way religion works? It's a tough question. Mm -hmm. Um, in the beginning of the field, of course, we just, they were just theories. There, were, there, were almost, there was only one real experimental psychologist that was working, and it was mostly questionnaires and things like that, you know, sort of quasi-experimental things. Right. Now we have hundreds and hundreds of people involved in the field um, that have conducted either experiments in a lab where you can control the variables, or like, uh, one of my colleagues, Demetrius Silagatis, who has, has developed a new field, experimental anthropology, where he takes these ideas and he actually goes out into the field and wires people up, you know, mm -hmm. and, and looks at different variables of uh, physiological change, chemical change, um, you know, what kinds of uh, the heart rate, mm -hmm. these, these kinds of things, right? And Demetrius has been a pioneer in this field and what, what he's been able to show is that um, we can go out into the field, but we have to have we have to have a very tight controls on these things because I mean there's 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 just hundreds if not thousands of variables going on right, right. so you can't measure everything you know you can't be the master of all trades mm -hmm. you have to specifically and you, you've got to think about the it's expensive to do these kind of studies so you have to really work these things out before by having an expert in religion or anthropology that knows the right questions that you're looking mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. and then a psychologist and a statistician who can say, and a research design person who can say, okay, we can test these two or three variables and control for them. We think we can control for them, right. and this is how we're gonna do it, right? And yeah, I mean, so y there, there are lots of different ways you can wire someone up. Um, there's, there's eye goggles, right, for, for, for eye stuff, movement. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got uh, brain uh, machines that are, that are transportable, right? right. Um, you have a heart rate, you, have, you can take samples of saliva and blood and things like that, and you can tease it out that way and it's, analyze it. It's pretty sophisticated stuff. Yeah, it, it really is. And, so, and it's a multidisciplinary approach. It, so it, it, and I like the fact that it's a consilience between disciplines. Right. Um, we no longer believe, at least cognitive scientists of religion do not believe that one person is going to come in and be the Stephen Hawking of, right, right. of the deal. Yeah. You're going to have to have multiple, multiple people, and that's what you see with the articles. There's multiple people, you know, sometimes double digits, that try to solve these problems. And the organization that you're with that kind of coordinates all this is Levina. Is that right? Yeah, I was at Levina from 2011 to 2013. Mm -hmm. um, that was the first cognitive science of religion, uh, religious studies program that dedicated itself to methodology, okay. these, these, these new methodologies of religion. It was the first place in the world solely to do that. Um, there are other places that do that, but, okay. they, they, but this one was solely dedicated to that yeah. type of work. Oh yeah, is there, what's the most surprising thing maybe um, that you have found given this approach to, to trying to understand the, the, the how, I think, as you put mm -hmm, it, of, mm -hmm. of what's going on. Is, is anything that's uh, come out of this cognitive study that, that has led you to just pause for a moment and say, man, I didn't think that was the case, or I didn't see right. that coming? Ooh, that's tough. That's a tough yeah. question. <laughs> um, the, the most surprising, not really surprising now when you look back, because hindsight's twenty twenty. Mm -hmm. but the really surprising work has been in developmental psychology with children. Oh. seeing when their brains mature enough to where the certain changes happen to where they process things um, in a certain way that could, might be comparable to religion. Hmm. Um, there's a famous experiment that was conducted on uh, called the Princess Alice experiment and we don't have time to go into the full details right. but they look at children and how they uh, represent sort of supernatural or not, or not supernatural but superhuman agents agents that are not physical, material human beings, and when they're in the room and 
you know, kind of what we used to think about fantasy, you know, right. fantasy or, or they make up imaginary friends. How does imaginary friends think, you know, fit in with what we think about religion as an adult? Hmm. And what we find, there are many similarities to when the brain sort of evolves to a certain age that it develops where it can process uh, these types of imaginary figures right. um, that are not that dissimilar from what we say when we're talking about spirits and gods and, and different kinds of uh, superhuman agents. Absolutely. So do you think, will this science take us to the place, and maybe we're already here, mm -hmm. where um, you can look at certain structures of the brain and say, this person is more predisposed to be religious or spiritual mm -hmm. than another person, just based solely on brain chemistry or brain structure? Is, well, the, the work is already being, uh, it's, already, it's already going there in personality. Okay. Theories of personality. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's a couple different things going on, but now we, we sort of know that um, people are EQ'd mm. for religious behavior. eq I believe. Like an equalizer. Okay. Think about like okay. a stereo. Okay. Um, each person has a different EQ. Um, for psychology people or people that have taken these Myers-Briggs tests and things, right. I, I've worked with the big five um, personality inventory. And there's a lot of work that's been going on now that we have these super uh, computers and analysis we can do that are much more sophisticated and a lot more people. Right. Um, what I found in my own work was that there are certain people that are more likely to be uh, feel contagion towards dead bodies, hmm. disgust, mm -hmm. these different mechanisms, uh, human mechanisms, and uh, there are certain people that have it turned way down and they are not moved at all. Right. Right. And what you find is in a religious setting with, de with dead bodies, which most religions have something to say about dead bodies, sure. if not all, yeah. um, the people that are the more empathetic, the more likely to be disgusted, are the ones that are more religious towards hmm. the dead bodies, typically. That's interesting. And this really has um, no connection to experience one's own experience, but rather is something that um, yeah. is a function of, of brain, yeah. brain function or mind. And the variability explains why cultures could be different. Right. Because if you have that many people that are all different the way they do it and they get together, you're going to have a different cultural context in every, every time you have a wow. different collection of people, mm -hmm. right? But I mean, th that being said, when you said about the, the, the actual brain, McCray is a famous psychologist of personality who has identified a relationship be between traits and alcoholism. Right. Which many people think will lead to a genetic or a biological foundation for personality and biology. Right. Well, this is such an exciting area of study. I, I find it fascinating and I have... Um, no doubt that you're going to produce important work that will advance our understanding of what it means to be religious or what it means yeah, to be spiritual. I hope so. I, I, well, you're already there. You've already produced <laughs> some important work. Uh, but I look forward to seeing uh, where this work takes you in the future. And we're thank very proud of you, Lee. Thank, thank you very much for having me, and I appreciate yeah. it. Uh, thank you. And thank you for joining us on Religion and Life here at TV. I want to thank again my guest, Dr. Lee McCorkle, for taking time out of his busy schedule to be with us today. Join us next week for another exploration of those life events that occur at the intersection of religion, society, and culture. Until then, this is Ozzy Ostwald.